Good morning, everyone. My name is Mary Jane Burke. I'm happy to welcome you to our phone call this morning. Um, we're having another opportunity uh, to get a chance to hear from our public health officials. Today, Dr. Willis um, is with us. Uh, we are going to redesign this call and we're handling it a little bit differently. The first part of this call will be exclusively Dr. Willis um, updating us on the current situation in our county and the current recommendations and directions uh, for our schools, whether they be private, public, independent, or parochial. And then the second half, um, the Rethinking Schools team will take over uh, to continue to look at the uh, guidelines that uh, we've been reviewing. So this will be a little bit different. Um, we appreciate your joining us very, very much. And I want to start by um, reading something that helps, I think, put some context around the information that Dr. Willis will be sharing. On June 18th, uh, we provided a public health guided return to site-based a classroom instruction. And as part of the opening paragraph, it said, the evolving nature of the COVID-19 pandemic requires the need to rethink common protocols and practices in the classroom setting with the understanding that these guidelines could change as the situation evolves. Uh, and Dr. Willis, I'm gonna have you take it from here to help provide our, our community with information about how, in fact, the situation has indeed evolved. Thank you. Thanks, Mary Jane. Can you see my slides? Yes. Great. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be here with you. Um, my, I just wanna start by kind of reorienting all of us to, um, the mission of the department that I work in, Department of Health and Human Services, that our goal is to promote and protect the health, well-being, self-sufficiency, and safety for all in Marin. Um, and, and I can be, um, I see that as what I am held accountable for as a health officer. Um, and then also just to remind us that the way we think of health and define health holistically in our approach to any decision, especially concerning COVID-19, and uh, reopening schools is that health is, as the World Health Organization defines it, a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity, which helps us um, navigate choices around balancing risks. Um, this is from uh, the kickoff of this series of conversations with schools about reopening. Um, I shared this as sort of a, a framing that I think is especially important now, as Mary Jane alluded to, that um, some of our shared values as we try and approach these and navigate these challenging decisions is that we're looking to, obviously all of those are important, but I think today, especially making sure that we're um, oriented towards the evidence around us. Um, and then one of the shared challenges that we acknowledge right off the bat is that we're in an environment of an uncertainty and, and a need to be adaptable. I'm gonna share with you some of just the, the status of the county with regards to our numbers. Um, and, and call your attention to, uh, we have a, a new website. Um, we've, we've modified um, and updated our, our public facing data, data page um, at, at coronavirus.marinhhs.org. Um, and these are some screenshots from that that I'll just sort of walk through to explain some of what's happening uh, in the wider context of COVID-19 in Marin and, and then get into how that affects our, our, our recommendations. So as of um, yesterday, this is, these numbers are updated um, about four o'clock each day. Um, we've tested nearly 40,000 individuals. We have um, 1,909 total cases thus far. Um, 85 people have been hospitalized overall. Um, right now there are 32 people in the hospital um, with 29 deaths in the county. We also are dealing with, as you know, um, a, a, the largest prison outbreak in the nation here at, at San Quentin State Prison, over 2,000 total cases, 1,200 now active cases, um, with uh, about eight of those individuals in our in our hospitals in Marin. This I think tells that you know a lot about our experience here in Marin, and this is a this is a pattern that is seen across the state and the region, which is just the total cumulative incidents over time. 
Um, and what's important about this is that um, obviously, since it's cumulative, you'll see more cases as more cases come in, but the slope is also increasing. So the, the rate of increase uh, in cases, um, it has accelerated, um, especially since about mid-June, we've seen um, more rapid increases in cases uh, each day. For this particular conversation, um, I wanna call your attention to the, uh, the incidents among young people um, we, we organize our data in a variety of ways demographically, and one is by looking at it by age group. This is that same graphic of just incidents over time broken down by different age groups. And if you look at the, what I've circled there for um, age zero to 18, looking back in May, um, you know, further to the left on this in April, that was the, the lowest prevalence age group across, of, of any. And as we got into June, the incidence in the, among that group started to increase um, and is now our third highest uh, prevalence group. Less than, and then the other, uh, the other age groups that have higher incidence are also among people um, younger ages, so less than 50. So the vast majority of our cases are people less than 50 years old, which is a shift in the, in the demographic of our experience with this epidemic in Marin County. Reassuringly, um, as we've seen um, increased incidents among young people, we also know, and this is something I shared with you before, that um, the risk of infection is lower for young people. And, the, uh, and this is just a review of, of some data we've already shared if you were on the first call. Um, that susceptibility to infection, this is based on a large meta-analysis of, of, of many nations um, that was published uh, in, uh, in mid, uh, just two weeks or three weeks ago. Um, the susceptibility infection for individuals under age 20 was about half of that for above age 20. And the clinical symptoms manifest in about one in five cases among younger people compared to people of older age. And that, that's borne out here in our own data in Marin. Um, if you look on the far left there, this is just the breakdown of our population as a county. About 21% of our, of our residents are less than age 18. Uh, they make up 17% of the cases. And again, that's, that's been rising as a fraction, but only 4% of our hospitalizations and none of our deaths. This is another important thing I look at when we're talking about what is our sort of community-wide prevalence and experience of COVID-19 is um, the total number of tests we're performing. Obviously that's an important goal for us to be able to test adequately. We had set a goal of about 500 tests um, per day we have uh, exceeded that, that, that benchmark. Um, but importantly, as we have tested more, our percent positivity has not been driven downward. In fact, it's, it's risen slightly, which is a strong indicator that um, the increase in, in cases we're seeing is not simply because we're testing more, but actually is that we're ascertaining cases where they exist. Um, and this right now, the percent positivity over the past week is about 6.5. So it has reassuringly declined a bit in the last week. It had been at 7.5 last week. Finally, just want to paint the picture in terms of what's happening across the state. Um, you know, the governor has, has mentioned this, um, and actually at, eight, at, at, at 9.30, I have a call with, with the state to discuss um, the state plan for um, potentially accelerating or, or more, more closures in reaction to to this reality, which is represented here, which is we're seeing across the state increases in people coming into the hospital for COVID-19 and people coming into the intensive care unit. And this is from, these are just graphics that represent from the beginning of April. Um, and you saw there that we, you know, we've had that first, what, were, what was being termed kind of the first wave um, with the flattening of the curve. There are definitely more people in, in hospitals in, in the state of California now with COVID-19 than ever before, and that number continues to rise. These are the things that we're looking at most closely in Marin. This is a dashboard that's visible. You can see this on our website. And it really, some people have asked, what are we, what are we focusing on in terms of these policy decisions around closures and reopenings? Um, and this is, um, I think, our best effort at capturing those most important indicators that reflect um, the risk for our hospital surges and the risk and, and, and the prevalence of community transmission. We look at total cases cumulatively per 100,000 in the past 14 days. And this is really an important number for us. So this is the single most important thing in terms of what is the burden in our community of COVID-19. 
um, and it's normalized to 100,000. 100, so right now, our rate is about 200, and, actually, I, I can't see that on this. There are 235 per 100,000 over the past two weeks. Um, and, uh, and that puts us in the moderate category, but we're almost in the severe category in terms of community transmission based on that rate. And then we also look at the percent positivity, as I mentioned, we're between five and 8% positivity. Um, total hospitalizations, we're looking at the percent of hospital beds that are occupied by COVID-19 patients as a marker of surge. And then another indicator of public health readiness. So this is, do our hospitals have enough PPE? Do we have enough testing capacity? Are we able to manage surge capacity? And can we keep up with contact tracing? And then finally, are we on the state monitoring list, um, which I'll get into shortly, because that's an important determinant in terms of our, um, our status with regards to school openings and closures. So this is the, the, uh, the state monitoring list. Now the, the state has, um, as of maybe three weeks, initiated a, a new process for helping control the spread of COVID-19 across the state by identifying counties where there's increased transmission and imposing shelter in place orders onto those counties, which is different than had been historically the, the approach, which was sort of the variant status where counties were able to go at their own pace um, we're now being, um, you know, the, 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 the orders that we're operating under in Marin County now are primarily derived from the state and, um, and are based on our status as being, on, as being one of 31 counties uh, on the state monitoring list based on these indicators. And you can see there, one of the indicators is a case rate of above, one, above 100 um, per 100,000 uh, over the past two weeks. So we, and I just, uh, illustrated that we're at, I think, 235. So we're significantly above that rate. Um, and we are uh, the, among the, these counties are all on the state monitoring list. And I've highlighted in bold those that are in the Bay Area, including Alameda, Contra Costa, Napa, Santa Clara, Solano, Sonoma. So neighboring counties um, all, all trigger to be on the monitoring list based on those indicators. And this is about this is probably 80 to 90% of the total population of the, of the state. So most, most residents of the state of California are in counties on the monitoring list. These are some of the things that we were needed to close based on being on the monitoring list. Indoor dining, non-essential offices uh, closed uh, on Monday of this week. Hair salons and barber shops had been opened. Indoor malls are, I think Northgate is our one. Um, and then uh, we were also told we cannot have any any further reopenings while we're on the watch list. Um, they have not yet, um, the state has not indicated whether or not schools is in that, in that category and that hopefully will be clarified later today in this conversation that's coming up. Um, but an important question for us is, will counties on the watch list be able to resume classroom-based education? So and if, the, you know, if the answer, uh, if the state makes a determination on that, um, that might be an important trigger for us to, to have another meeting to determine what, what is the state determined that we can or can't do based on our status on the watch list with schools and how do we adapt to that. So the state is taking a, a, a stronger role in determining our, our local policies with regards to schools and we're, we're going to need to again apply that principle of being adaptive and flexible once the state clarifies their position there. Um, so this is the, um, the recommendation. There was a, a press release last night um, indicating that uh, we, working with public health, working with the, the Office of Education, as we have been um, you know, shoulder to shoulder all along, um, made a determination that we should delay the return to classroom-based learning through Labor Day at the earliest. Um, and that's based simply on the fact that we are seeing increased transmission in our community um, there's no sign of a flattening of the curve of that increase that we're seeing um, and that that has accelerated since, um, since the time where we had offered the recommendation to do all we can to resume classroom-based learning. Again, based on the principle that we think and, 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 st and still share the vision that the best place for kids during school is in school um, for all the reasons we've described, but um, the risk has shifted. Um, so why now? And, you know, the, and the answer is that the risk has shifted based on increased regional and local transmission. Um, when you have a prevalence as high as we have now, the risk of 
the experience being even more disruptive because of cases that you might have during the school setting and, and closures as we've assigned we would do in our guidelines if there's cases within clusters or within uh, cohorts. Um, the, the, the probabilistically the likelihood of, of serial closures increases, which would be even more disruptive. Um, there's also a return towards under the governor's order um, and our status on the monitoring list. And as I indicated, some of those sectors that are reclosing, we're returning towards a shelter in place approach and philosophy community wide to reduce overall mobility. Um, another important factor is that testing resources statewide are limited. And we know in order to really um, more safely reopen schools, we need to be able to test when there are cases in school of those individuals who may have been exposed. We also have a you know, plan to make sure that teachers and staff are tested on a regular basis um, to ensure their safety and, and the safety of the environment. And as long as the state testing resources collectively are constrained and turnaround times are lengthened, um, we're not as confident that we're gonna have access to that vital resource that we need um, to be adaptive if there are cases in, the, in that setting. And that's something that uh, needs time to build. So we're gonna be using this time to enhance staff on-site preparations and secure those resources we need um, to resume in, in school learning. These are some of the, uh, I'll just end with this, some of the obviously concerns with delaying school openings is um, mixing of children outside of school. And we've talked about this before as one of the rationales for bringing children together into cohorts at the school, because um, we know that there's even already, um, I mean, it's amazing, even some of our, you know, some of our friends hearing that we're, we're going to delay are trying to figure out how are we gonna get, you know, how are we going to manage children at home now? Um, and, and are there going to be informal cohorts forming where children from different households are together just out of nothing else, the practical need to, for that kind of supervision. Um, and, and what does that mean in terms of mixing? And if, those are, if that is done in a haphazard way or in a random way, or there are different groups on a Monday versus a Tuesday versus a Wednesday, are we actually gonna see more mixing, which could undermine the whole goal? So that's an important, you know, and, and we'll be working on some guidance on, on how to navigate those, those diff you know, difficult decisions. Um, home supervision needs, of course, uh, is, a, is a concern. Um, parent or supervisor roles, making sure that there's, you know, this is obviously an important equity issue because not all families can afford um, to have one parent or someone, you know, an adult supervising a child at the home each day, all day. Um, the tech divide is an important consideration. Um, you know, distance learning has been a really, I think, negative experience for, for many, um, and that has been differentially experienced by people um, of income disparities. Um, obviously, mental health, social health, we've had conversations, really helpful and informative conversations with students. Um, and, and we really heard and highlighted the, the effect it's having on them mentally and socially to be, to be not able to interact with their peers in person. Um, and that's something that we're going to need to, if we don't reopen, um, really find ways to, to support people in that context um, where they're at home. And then obviously the concern about lost learning, if we, if we believe that the, the classroom-based educational experience itself is, is, is superior to a distance experience, what does that mean in terms of the learning itself? So here, just to summarize our challenge, and this is exactly what we had said um, at the end of our, our launch, um, how do we continue, safely continue to reopen knowing the virus is part of our environment? We do it carefully, we're doing it together, we have to optimize self measures. And this is more important than ever. If we wanna get back into school, we're gonna to have to do everything, everything we can society-wide. This is not just for the school community, this is for everyone in Marin County to do everything we can to limit those acts of transmission where they're occurring in our community. And it's simple. Maintaining six foot distance, covering our face, um, just those two things. It's very difficult for the virus to be transmitted from one person to another if you just do those two things. Um, and so whenever there's a case, I'm always, okay, where was it where that person was closer than six feet without a mask on? Um, and it's usually much closer, you know, four, you know, three, four feet. Um, and then we're, you know, obviously recognizing and mitigating the risk, following the data. Again, that's why I um, highlight the data for you, um, because I want to just make sure that we're grounded at each step 
in what, what the information is telling us um, about what's happening in our community. Um, and then we have to be adaptive and flexible um, and rethink assumptions of how things are done. So that's where we are today. I know it's, um, I know it's a challenge to um, be invited to plan for one contingency and then have that change. Um, and I, I think, but I think the, the most important thing for us is also just to recognize that health ultimately is what's at stake here, thinking holistically about health in terms of physical, social, um, and, and mental well-being. And that this is, this is the call that I think is uh, the right call for now based on um, what we're seeing in terms of increased virus transmission in our community. Thank you. Great, thank you, Dr. Willis. Could you describe what would need to be in place for you to allow in-person um, school to begin at right after Labor Day? Yeah, I mean, there's two, there's two factors there. There's, you know, what we would decide based on our own incidents, um, and then there's what the state would allow in terms of the law. Um, and so I wanna make a distinction there because um, we may, you know, we may be really functioning within a legal framework here in terms of uh, what, what, the, what the state orders require us based on our status on the monitoring list. I imagine we're going to stay on that watch list, um, you know, because our, our prevalence is above twice the minimum to, to, you know, that would be required. Um, and it's going to be a while before we get to that stage. So if there's a, if there's a linking of reopening to, to watch list status, um, that in itself is probably going to require that we would, we would remain closed for longer. And we'll know more about that maybe even later today after the governor's announcement is scheduled for noon. Mm -hmm. um, from my perspective, I, that those indicators on the monitoring list, I think are really important indicators as well. Um, we'll be looking at our, our community incidents. You know, we take, a, we take a holistic view of this. So I wanna, you know, if we, if we have, if we understand where the virus is flowing in the community, we have strategies to address it. Our hospitals have plenty of surge capacity. Um, we have testing capacity. We have contact tracing capacity. Um, we can independently, if we have that freedom at the local level, um, begin to resume classroom-based learning. And we would, again, be following the data. Um, one potential contingency would be in the fashion that we had done during the initial shelter in place where the cohorts were smaller. Um, but I think, you know, the, um, I should have mentioned it before, but I, you know, I think this is a sign that distance learning, um, we had always been saying that there is no, there is no contingency where distance learning is not important, um, just because we knew that school closures might happen and that there are some children who won't be coming into the classroom based on uh, medical conditions or other conditions, um, and that we needed to be able to offer distance learning and, and plan for that. Um, that piece is obviously now um, accelerated because that's going to be the primary option, at least for the short term. Mm -hmm. um, do you uh, think that at some point when we go, um, we look again at in-person learning, that we would relook our guidelines that were issued on June 18th and potentially go back to only allowing students to come to school in the small cohorts of 12? Yeah, as I said, I think that's one of the, you know, again, we'd have to see what the state allows. And one of the differences, I think, with the, the state approach now is that it's much more deterministic about what locals are allowed to do. So it's a, it's a different experience. You know, I'm essentially, my role as a health officer is, is more in deferring to what the state is offering. I mean, in many states and in many nations, in fact, these policies are derived from at that level. It's a, it's a unique experience in, in the state of California where they're sort of been hyper local um, and that is shifting. And so um, we will obviously first um, determine what the state would, would allow us to do. But I think we've demonstrated in Marin that we can safely engage children in schools in, in stable cohorts of 12. Um, and we know how to do that. We've had that experience. We even had that experience where we've had a case or cases in those settings and, and managed you know, very well to sort of have a, have a quick response, limit the transmission and move back right back into that setting. I think we lost you know, nine days um, from one cohort or two cohorts uh, across more than a thousand um, cohort days. Right. 
Um, Matt, there's several comments about the frustration that whether we're in school or not in school, that our students and their families are mixing in ways that did not follow the guidelines. Is there any work being done to address sort of the PR side of how important it is um, to make sure that you know kids are wearing masks, that's, that they're keeping their distance, washing their hands, et cetera? And we heard that from students as well. Yeah, I mean, I'm, you know, I, I'm open to, <laughs> I, I think we've been clear um, that that's not safe. Um, and um, I even tried to offer some guardrails through the social bubbles concept for um, acknowledging that people are, you know, have social lives and friendships that, that, that it's, it's really been a challenge for us to not even have any interaction in person. So groups of 12 that you pick as your, as your group um, where you're socially distanced outdoors um, as, and that's it, you know, in terms of the, the social interactions, you know, we, um, just because we are um, bored or, or um, missing our friends um, and, and, and getting fatigued um, in terms of the shelter in place doesn't mean the virus, you know, the virus timeline and our, our own sort of collective psychology are just on two different timelines. And the virus is actually ramping up while at the same time we are getting collectively fatigued around the strategies that prevent transmission um, and that's a really concerning pattern. Um, and unfortunately, the message is that we really need to behave much more like we did in March and April. Um, uh, and, uh, and really, you know, the, the, the default should be sheltering in, in place with the exception of those things that we've allowed to come back online. And then, you know, again, remembering that when we're out in the community, really covering our face and maintaining that social distance is vital. Mm -hmm. Um, Matt, when, the, when we do come back and we offer in-person learning, um, will there be a guarantee that, that we will have rapid testing with rapid results? Yeah, I mean, the rapid, so there's, you know, rapid testing is the, um, technically is, um, you know, it, it, it's a quick turnaround time. There's different technologies, Abbott is one. Um, there's, there's trade-offs on that. They're, they're not quite as accurate. Um, and it's not clear to me that, you know, a rapid testing strategy is the best one in all settings because of the limited accuracy. You're trading speed for accuracy. And there's certain situations where you might want to have, you know, a quicker result, but, uh, but and you could be more tolerant of, a, of an incorrect result. But those settings are limited. Um, the, I think the best answer, unless there's a, there's a change in the, in the, in the technology, the best answer is um, a rapid turnaround, like a 24 hour turnaround for a, a PCR test that's sent to a laboratory for processing the nasal swab. Um, and that's something that's, that's a goal. We, you know, the UCSF Biohub is, is ramping up their capacity for this. Um, and the state recognizes this is a, a huge priority. The, the governor has assigned an entire task force just to increasing test, you know, increase testing capacity um, across the board. Mm -hmm. Um, this is a question about special ed. Does this apply to special ed classes? These classes typically have under 12 kids, have been operating successfully for several uh, weeks. Most of the kids cannot access education via Zoom. Distance learning doesn't work. Can you confirm that this will continue for special ed kids, the small cohorts? I can't confirm. I, you know, again, we're, um, we're waiting to see what the what the governor announces as being, I, I, I think we've been clear that we can do this ourselves um, in Marin County. Um, and, uh, and it's been a really important and valuable um, method for, for meeting the needs of a, a certain set of our, our children um, and would, would continue to do that um, if we can, if we can. Okay. Okay, Dr. Willis, with that, I know we just hit your time where you have to jump onto your next call. I just want to thank you very much. Um, I know our community appreciates um, the fact that um, in the end, um, our public health team um, is going to do the right thing for our community, uh, regardless of the political pressure that comes from a myriad of sources. So thank you very, very much. We look forward to our next conversation. So. Okay.
Thank you. And just a reminder to everyone, this is recorded uh, within a couple of hours that will be available um, for you to share uh, far and wide with other members of our community. And at this point, I'm going to go ahead and pass uh, this conversation to, I think, Mike Grant and Ken Lippy. I'm not sure which person will take the lead on this. All right. Thank you, Mary Jane. We're going to kind of uh, do a little tag team here. So um, what we're, what we're going to um, move forward with uh, is a discussion of the guidelines uh, number 16 through 30. And uh, what we realize is, go ahead and move forward. Yeah, um, these guidelines, as we review them, these are less a public health question in terms of implementation than a logistics uh, a logistics question at each school site. So um, as part of um, a school site um, risk assessment, a school site, a school site specific protection plan, the best case scenario is that there's a team at each school, multidisciplinary team with teachers and um, classified staff and labor representatives and administrators and parents and even students to walk through and look at how these guidelines most effectively overlay on air, each particular campus. It might look a little bit different. We're hoping, well, what we, we know is that best practices will emerge and be shared um, among among schools and districts so uh, districts and so schedules for arrivals recess and lunch uh, will be strategically coordinated prevent the mixing of classroom cohorts this has to do with bell schedules and if if you know 800 middle school students are arriving at the same time it's very difficult to control uh, physical distancing and 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 when uh, students are out for recess so this is just a logistical uh, kind of class and bell schedule uh, uh, um, challenge that needs to be addressed at each site. Um, guideline number 17, and Ken and Melina, if there's questions that are coming up specific to these guidelines, um, feel free to uh, um, you know, interrupt and we can address them. Uh, congregate congregate movement, movement through hallways will be minimized as much as possible. This is very much related to guideline 16. There's been some school site walkthroughs that staff have discussed kind of having one way uh, you know, arrows in, in, the, in the hallways and corridors, uh, much like you'd see in some of the grocery stores. And um, but more importantly about the congregate movement is when students are doing recess and lunch and outdoor activities. Um, go ahead to the next slide, Melina. Uh, large ga gatherings, uh, school assemblies are prohibited. This is pretty much self-explanatory. The, uh, you know, the, the guideline is the, really the cohort size, so there won't be large ga gatherings until this changes. Um, go ahead, Melina. Okay, so, the use of outdoor space for instructional purposes is, is maximized, shared, and coordinated to ensure students remain in their cohort. Uh, this, I know Dr. Willis has um, emphasized in meetings in the past that he sees this as the biggest potential for kind of a culture shift, a, a, a change in, in how we uh, you know, utilize our space at campuses and even beyond campuses. Right here at the Marin County Office of Education, where our Marin's Community School is located, there are three city parks literally within a quarter mile walk of this site. Some of those parks have shaded areas and places where instruction could take place. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, um, every school site's a little bit different. Shade obviously is an issue, seating areas, but what we're anticipating and encouraging is schools to think creatively about how uh, students and staff in an organized and coordinated way can move out of the classroom and meet under the, under the oak tree here at the Marins Community School. We've set up chairs out under the oak tree and, and there's, uh, I know some schools have the fortune of having shade structures and so forth. Um, 
the use of shared playground equipment will be limited. Uh, this kind of speaks for itself. Uh, I know there are situations, particularly in el elementary school, where the shared playground equipment, uh, you know, uh, will be a big part of outdoor recreation and just needs to be awareness of uh, protocols and procedures for cleaning it to the extent possible between uses to minimize the spread of, uh, of germs. Okay. Uh, and then guideline number 21, uh, you know, this is the use of space that you normally wouldn't use for classroom instruction, like gyms and multi-use rooms uh, to support physical distancing, uh, to maximize the use of that space. And, and this is where teachers or, or, uh, or clusters of, of classrooms and cohorts may rotate use of those facilities. And again, with the, with the cleaning logistics in between. Uh, guideline 22 speaks for itself about uh, about um, how meals are being served and that you won't be you know seeing use of cafeterias or dining rooms I'd say outside would be a priority as much as possible and then the individually plated bag meals as well okay our next one uh, so this this I know um, possibly for some schools will be one of the most challenging. We just got an email last night about a parent who's concerned that uh, the, the school that their child attends doesn't have hot water. Well, we've been assured by public health that cold soap and cold water and soap is perfectly fine. More importantly is just the, the the, the practice and procedure and training and role modeling of properly washing hands and doing it on regular intervals. So, uh, you know, it's almost like, you know, for those classrooms that have uh, sinks and soap in them, that's perfect. Every student when they come in every day takes 20 seconds to wash their hands and that's going to take time to get everyone through. And then there are other schools and sites where students are going to have to use the restrooms or other facilities to wash their hands, but it's logistics and scheduling about making that a part of every day and a significant uh, priority for everyone's uh, health and safety. Okay. Ray, so there's a question, um, Itoko, what is a regular interval? And, uh, you know, we have some of our special education classrooms have decided to do it every hour on the hour. There, there are small enough cohorts where they can do that. Um, and, uh, you know, and then there are other situations where, you know, it's it's right when you arrive, it's before recess, it's after recess, it's before lunch, it's after lunch, it's before restroom use, it's after restroom use, and it's the end of the day before you go home. So, uh, you know, I think that every site, every grade level, and depending on the hand washing, the, the um, uh, the proximity to hand washing stations. I think that each school and maybe even each teacher can develop their own routine, but we recognize, we all embrace and recognize that this is, this will be a significant priority to support the health and safety in addition to the, all the, all the other ones. But hand washing is one that I know public health has emphasized is something that we, we need to really focus on. Uh, Training for staff and students will include proper use of face coverings, which will include instruction to minimize touching of face coverings. So we had a, we had a call, um, was it yesterday or the day before, with a group of uh, high school and middle, middle school students, and they, they came forward and said, there were, the question was, hey, high school students, would you really wear face coverings? Where your, will your colleagues really wear face coverings? And the answer was, look, if that's what we have to do, if, if we have to wear face coverings and we have to wear them right and hold each other accountable in order to be at school together, we'll do it. And most of us will will hold each other accountable, remind each other. And, you know, you know this, this is not okay. The nose is not okay. And, you know, um, you know fiddling with them. So, so there's, there are, um, you know, videos and trainings on how to do it. Um, we, we actually have our high school uh, uh, group of students are going to be 
starting to sh um, develop and share some videos to promote this practice on social media and to emphasize that um, even though you young person might not be as susceptible to serious um, you know disease or serious response to COVID-19 it's it's not just you it's your friend's grandparent or it's your own grandparent and it's a it's a responsibility that each of us have to each other to take care of one another um, the, um, okay, so go ahead and you do the next one. Next slide. Sharing of supplies, manipulatives, and toys. I know that we we have uh, gotten a lot of inquiry about this, particularly for the young, uh, you know, pre preschool and and younger TK students. That it's such a it's such a a, a basic part of the preschool experience. Our teachers you know, teach students to share. That's part of the, the instruction, but now we're saying, no, it's only for you. So what the, the best, the best uh, um, uh, advice that we've gotten from our own special education classroom teachers is that there are certain things that are shared. And the question is how to manage the, the, the sanitization and cleaning of those items. So we have a practice in some of our special ed classes where there is a bin where after a student uses them, they go in the bin and then once or twice a day or at the end of the day, the teacher takes the time to go through and, and clean them with soap and water and let them air dry. Um, and then there are other teachers Teachers who've, who've asked Dr. Willis, well, if I share a book, can I put it on the shelf and leave it there for three days um, without having to disinfect it? And the answer was, yeah, three days. Uh, it would, you know, because of the half-life of the virus, that that would be a safe practice. But it's to manage uh, that, that um, uh, you know, that act of sharing supplies and manipulatives. So, um, the next one is electronic devices, clothing, books, other games, learning. I think that is kind of in the same area um, uh, as guideline number 26. So I'm going to move. So this is one I know that all of us have uh, seen, you know, from pictures uh, around the, the country and in, 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 in China and South Korea and other, other places that students have returned to school where there's these plexiglass barriers to help. Um, it's just one other, it's one other uh, measure that can be taken to help spread the transmission of COVID-19. And we know that the demand is high for these and the expense is high at this point for plexiglass. There are some new products that are coming out that are much lighter and more portable that we're gonna be testing out. We've ordered some, uh, uh, some material that is more like corrugated plastic, but serves as a screen between desks or even in restrooms. And so uh, again, it's as much as you can. It's one other measure we can take um, to help uh, slow the spread, control the spread of the virus. Okay, uh, number 29 is, uh, you know, this, this is a fairly significant change in practice. And I know even in this building here at the Marin County Op Office of Education, we are now closed to the public. This is a place where our staff work, the doors are locked, there's a check-in procedure. Um, when vendors come onto the site to work on the HVAC system, there's a very specific protocol that they go through. We have a record of their presence and where they are and how long they're here and uh, an agreement that they'll follow all of our health and safety guidelines in terms of physical distancing uh, and uh, face coverings and so forth. So um, I know that parent volunteers have uh, traditionally in many school settings played a, a significant support and in this case um, we are uh, really limiting uh, and really uh, not not permitting non-essential visitors so this will be a change in practice every school site will have to work with their community to understand the importance of, of this new guideline and how it's going to be implemented okay so uh, our last one is the school site specific protection plan. And I know many schools and districts are working hard on these right now and, and beginning to articulate how implementation will happen at their sites. Um, we have a, uh, we, for the next three Fridays at 10 a.m., we'll continue to have uh, these implementation uh, technical assistance workshops. It's more of a, a dialogue and discussion about how schools are um, coming up with protocols 
protocols and procedures to most effectively uh, meet the needs of their students and their staff and community to implement these guy these uh, these plans. So I think that I will leave it at that. Um, it's it's nine forty five right now. Ken or Melina, are there any uh, any questions from the chat box at this point that um, I can help address? Um, Mike, one of the questions that's come in is related to what we heard from Dr. Willis and small cohorts um, for schools that had planned to bring students in. Does this change uh, that plan? And what we've learned so far, and keep in mind that this is going to be ever evolving today as we hear more about the governor's announcements, but the, the latest release from Dr. Willis, his latest recommendations that he referred to that came out last evening, um, allows for cohorts, small cohorts, to come in prior to the start day of September 8th, but limited to practices of orientation, of uh, meeting teachers, of reviewing health policies. In other words, to use that period of time to make everyone as comfortable as possible with returning to school, but that regular class, academic class, and daily attendance recommended not to begin um, prior to that September 8th date pending further direction. Now that all may change today as we hear um, what the governor announces for counties on the watch list, as Dr. Willis mentioned, that even may restrict further the ability to bring cohorts in at all. So we're gonna be watching that closely. Um, the, the other questions, Mike, were related a lot to uh, the, the information that Dr. Willis provided related to his new rulings um, and recommendations. Um, and then there, there are questions, Mike, that maybe you want to talk about, about the, the challenges of masks with the younger kids, maybe what were um, some of the information related to our um, pop-up child care and summer cohorts. Maybe you could share how that, what we're learning about masks related to that. Yeah, so the, the main feedback that we've gotten from our team is that kids have been, you know, uh, remarkably uh, willing and tolerant and able to, uh, you know, uh, basically meet the challenge. And uh, I, what we're thinking is that, uh, you know, the, the earlier that families and parents can work with their kids to get started on this and make it fun and you know even in the early days of the pop-up child care there was a period of time early on where the state you know said masks you know face coverings are required and um, you know even at the very young ages above two years old and the the staff at the pop-up child care said the kids are in and especially if you make fun masks that have you know you know children designs or costume kind of looks to them that the kids will do it um, we know that behavior Behaviorally and medically, uh, for some students, it's not, by, it, it's not, you can't do it, <clears throat> but I think that it's just going to be um, um, a recognition that it's going to take time to, uh, to help role model and train students and staff to wear them. And, and one of the high school students said yesterday who works um, in, a, in a retail or maybe I think it's a grocery store setting that the first week or two was very challenging but then you just get used to it and i think around this office as well it's just a new it's a new uh, experience and once it becomes the norm that uh it is um much more uh you know it's going to take some time but but the, the whole the whole point is that it's the big it's it'll be a significant part of supporting the health and safety of our students and staff to teach role model in this practice Here's one. Um, please speak to the preparations for robust distance learning. There's actually quite a few questions on distance learning. Um, can you please be transparent and indicate if the past four weeks were essentially lost time in this regard? Well, we certainly hope not. Um, we don't consider any of the time that we spent over the last four weeks as a lost time because we have put in place guidelines and recommendations that eventually will be used to get kids back in classrooms. So first and foremost, we think the last month has been essentially important. Um, the relationship between what we're doing and distance learning, we are of course in support in any way we can related to districts in their distance learning plans and programs. We have a team here at our um, 
MCOE Ed Services Office that has done professional development in this area for districts. But primarily, the districts are planning their distance learning based on uh, their plans for opening their schools. And so all of them have indicated for the most part that they will be offering distance learning programs. If you need specific information related to what they're doing, then I suggest you contact your local district to get that. Um, we and, are- Hey Ken, um, so, so yes. the, only, the only thing that I would just wanna to add to that is that, you know, in terms of, you know, the, the work that has been done really since the, the shelter in place started in the middle of March about, um, um, we knew what it we, we knew how to close how, how to close schools in the age of COVID nineteen. That happened almost overnight. But from that day, that we have been working with public health is okay. We know how to close schools now. How do you reopen them to site based classroom instruction? And so all of the work has been towards okay. How will it look? to operate a school with COVID-19 still in our environment? What are the things that we can do to ensure that we are doing everything possible to maximize the health and safety of our staff and students? And so that work, um, whether, whether a, a school opens to site-based instruction on September 8th, or any date into the future, this work is critical. And so, you know, I, I I want to just, you know, emphasize how we all know that there will be a day that students will be back in school. And the real question is, how will it look uh, to staff and students and families so that we are confident and know that we're, we're, we're operating in a way that we are doing, taking every possible measure to make it safe. And so um, that, that is really the, the task at hand and it will continue to be. And um, you know, we're, we're moving strong in that direction. There's a question about the September 8th date. There's actually, again, a few about that and whether or not um, it should be reconsidered given that there is a holiday weekend and there have been notices of surges after uh, similar occurrences. And you know, I guess the way we would answer that is, as Dr. Willis said today, that that, that date is his best uh, information as of today. And that, of course, the, the monitoring will continue. The monitoring that he has been doing that led him to make that announcement yesterday is, it is an example of how he's using the current science and data related to Marin and our region to guide the decision. So if an, we, we, we know this, he will not uh, recommend the opening, fully opening of schools until he knows it's safe to do so, until that there's adequate testing available and procedures uh, in place. And so that, that will continue to be be evaluated as we go along. So I think that takes us to the end of our time. Reminder that we can continue this discussion tomorrow at 10 o'clock through the technical assistance workshop that will be offered here. And we um, thank you for joining us today and look forward to you talking to you again in the near future. And stay tuned because as you heard, this is gonna be a day where new news will probably be made related to many of the things that we're talking about. So thank you again. Bye-bye. Th thanks, everyone.